Get ready for season three of the Tron Grand Hackathon 2022 with a total of $1.2 million in prizes across Web3, DeFi, GameFi, NFTs, and the newly added Academy and Ecosystem tracks. The wait is over. Tron Grand Hackathon presented by TronDAO. To learn more, visit trondao.org. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and not necessarily those of the blocks. Podcast guests may have taken positions in the assets or other matters discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. For full terms, visit theblockcrypto.com slash terms dash service. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, editor-at-large at The Block, and we have a very exciting and timely show for you folks today. Joining us on the other side of the mic is our guest, Brian Armstrong, founder and CEO of crypto exchange Coinbase. They made a very interesting announcement earlier this week and reached out to us and asked us if we were interested in watching an early screening for their documentary that dropped today called coin and i was actually surprised i didn't know this was in the works it's been in development for over about three years at this point and it is a full-on documentary i brian i'll tell you about my setup last night i went outside i got the string lights in the courtyard i set up the mm -hmm. projector i watched it outside you know underneath the starry sky of brooklyn and i feel like we can start maybe by what really surprised me. And then I want to get the origin story. Folks, you really need to check this out. It's not what you probably would expect. It's not like a quick 20 minute hit pontificating about Bitcoin. This really tells a very raw story about not just why crypto matters, but also the raw story of what it's like to be a founder, the positives, the drawbacks. It tells a raw story about the mistakes people might make building a company. And it is very honest about that and very honest about the industry as well. Is that what you were sort of going for here? Kind of maybe highlighting misconceptions about you, about crypto, and about Coinbase as a firm? Yeah, exactly. Um, it has been in the works for a long time. We didn't talk too much about it. We kind of kept it secret. And um, I guess I decided to make this film because I wanted to tell the story of what it really is like to create a company, a tech company, all the way from being you know, on your laptop, writing the first few lines of code to going and becoming a public company, which is a crazy journey. It is filled with lots of ups and downs. I wanted to kind of demystify that process and encourage more people to go try and start companies because I think oftentimes founders are sort of either put on a pedestal or vilified. And the reality is sometimes maybe much different than people might think if you peel back the curtain. It's it's a bunch of quirky characters behind the scenes trying to make something useful in the world. And it's full of all kinds of mistakes, drawbacks, pros and cons, drama. <laughs> and yeah. I wanted to capture that in a really authentic way. I guess, Frank, if I can say one more thing, that I was also thinking a few years back when this was happening, I was thinking, you know, someday I hope we're on a path to, to be a public company, do something really big in the world. And I was worried that somebody was going to go try to tell the story. You know, I, I had seen that movie, The Social Network that Aaron Sorkin wrote. And ironically, that film, I think, inspired a lot of people to become entrepreneurs, but it was kind of a negative film on Facebook. At some point in my mind, I was thinking, I hope somebody doesn't go and you know do a hit piece story on us. So maybe if I go and tell the authentic story first, it'll negate some of that. Yeah, it definitely speaks to the strategy that Coinbase has employed with media relations, getting ahead of certain stories, telling the story yourself. I've seen that happen numerous times in over the course of the past five years that I've covered the company. But did you originally think that you'd share and reveal some of those more uncomfortable moments? I mean, I was really struck by the honesty of the neutrino incident or acquisition, rather, the honesty of the backlash on your stance on sort of political matters. Was that something that happened through the development or was that the intention? Like, let's really tackle these really thorny issues that have kind of put Coinbase in the sort of line of fire, as it were? 
Yeah. So when I was first conceiving of the film, I, I did have this thought in my head and I, through finding Greg Coe's the director, he and I kind of had an agreement we were like, all right, if this film is going to be any good, we're going to have to show the real shit, you know, the stuff that's probably kind of embarrassing. And in the moment, it's going to feel scary to have cameras on during this stuff because you never know in the moment, these things feel terrible. And then, you, you know, a few years back, you can look back and sort of see it with a different lens. I can tell you there was definitely moments during the filming where I was like, oh my God, why are we filming this? This might be like a terrible idea. And uh, yeah, there, it was like the mission focused thing. That was a piece of it. Delete Coinbase, you know, hashtag trending, the neutrino stuff. There was even like film, we filmed like sessions with my executive coach, you know, which is basically like a therapist. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it got kind of uh, personal. Even stuff where I was like, you know, in my pajamas or like, you know, just looking like an idiot playing VR or whatever. So and I kept having this thought throughout the filming process. I was like, this is either really smart because it's going to humanize us and just show the vulnerability, or I'm a complete idiot and we're going to totally regret this. And, you know, I've only seen a rough cut of the film. I, I'm going to see the final version that sounds like you've already seen at a screening that's coming up, hopefully. But yeah, I think it turned out really good. And I can tell you, by the way, if you're curious, you know, Greg Coe's the director. He had full creative control, actually. And you might wonder, like, why did I even feel the trust to go in and <laughs> allow someone to do that. The reason is we structured a kind of a unique agreement with him where Coinbase decided to fund the film. In case you're curious, I think it was maybe about $2 million or something like that. Um, and we actually had the right to shelve it at the end. If we didn't, if we thought he didn't do a fair take, just put the company at risk from a liability point of view or whatever, we had the opportunity to shelve it. But as Greg has told me, that's actually been true on every project he's ever, every film he's ever made. The funding, you know, the production company, whoever's funding it always has the right to shelve it. But he had final cut. He had full creative control. And even when he showed me the rough cut, you know, I had a couple of questions. I was like, well, how'd you decide to do that and that? And I gave him a couple of suggestions, but I didn't have the ability to change anything, nor did I, frankly, you know, feel that the need to push back in a strong way because... He did show people who disagree with us, people who thought that we had made mistakes, but I actually thought it was a very fair take. And so I'm happy with how it turned out. And it took a lot of trust between Greg and I. So there was no negotiation in terms of the outcome of this film, aside from a binary, it gets released or it doesn't. That's right. Yeah. I sent him a couple of questions, like in an email, like, you know, are people going to understand how this piece happened? And I, a couple of things like that. I didn't have the ability, nor did I try to get him to cut out any pieces of it. And I think most people who've seen it are going to come away feeling like it was actually a pretty fair story. Like it showed the stuff we did well and the stuff we did poorly. I think it also shows just how the degree to which you can really rock a onesie. I was very <laughs> impressed by that. <laughs> yeah. For people who are curious what Frank's talking about, I mean, in the early days of Coinbase, I was just sitting around writing a lot of code, you know, 12 hours a day. And for whatever reason, I had this onesie pajamas and there were some funny photos that emerged of that years later, which you know, will live in infamy. <laughs> Forever on screen and on the big yeah. screen and in my backyard. So let me talk about this one visceral scene that was at least very impactful for me because, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of you. I know many of the ins and outs of Coinbase. I was surprised about your sort of lack of comfortability managing people over the years. And there's this visceral scene with your executive coach. Let's play that right now. The elephant in the room is that you don't love to manage people. And my prediction, therefore, is that you're not good at it. Now I'd like you to go. I want you to go Cro-Magnon, whether you think you're Cro-Magnon or not. Uh -huh. Doesn't matter. Okay. And the structure of I blame forces you to go Cro-Magnon. Okay. Matt, I, I blame you for um, being so persistent on this and not letting it un unfold naturally. Every time we meet, we have to talk about the same goddamn issue. And <laughs> we've been over this a million times, just like, let me do my own thing. Awesome. Who else can you blame? Um, yeah, I blame myself, too, for trying to hold on to this thing that I'm not great at and um, isn't bringing me, isn't raising my energy. Are you willing to sort of see how these are crazy thoughts, you blaming yourself and you blaming other people? Yeah. That no one's a villain here. They're yeah. They're all just people that are trying to do their best. Yeah. Right on. How has that evolved in terms of your development? Like, is this something that you would recommend to other founders and CEOs? Yeah, so people may not know that. Um, I actually never had managed a single person before starting Coinbase. You know, I was mostly like a, an engineer, a product manager type person. I had tried starting another company out of college, a tutoring company, yeah. and I had 
managed to get a bunch of contractors hired and things like that. But it was very small. We didn't raise any money, anything like that. Mostly just me working with my friends. So I'd never formally managed anybody. And, you know, you grow as an entrepreneur, right? I started with, we had 10 people, then we had 100, and then we had 500. And eventually, you know, got almost 5,000 people now. I don't think I'm that great of a people manager, honestly, to be totally frank with you. I think I'm, I'm reasonable at it. I've learned a lot over the years. Executive coaching has helped a lot. And I've had probably three or four different executive coaches over the years, you know, just to try to get up the learning curve on all this different stuff. But I've been able to partner with really amazing people over the years. You know, Fred Ursum early on, who co-founded the company with me, and Emily Choi, who's now the president and COO at Coinbase. And, you know, she's kind of like a world-class people manager and tractor of talent in, into the company and things like that. So, you know, I think a lot of companies, if you go look at it, it is the pairing of different skill sets, which makes it successful. It's not like nobody's good at everything. And so, um, you know, there's some stuff that I can do, but I'm not like the best at it. And the stuff that I really like to do is build great products with technology. And so I'm kind of more like the engineering product side and helping set the culture of Coinbase, helping set the strategy. I think those are moments where I brought some of that founder energy and then partnered with others that complement me well. Another interesting point in the film was the very honest discourse between you and Fred, where both of you are on screen talking about how effectively you couldn't continue running the company together. And it was, it was very honest. It was kind of a, an ultimatum, if you will, where Fred and you decided, well, only one of us can really be in charge. How did that decision pan out? Why don't we have a Coinbase today where maybe Fred is the CEO? You know, a lot of startups, they go through this where there's founder challenges, if you will, right? It's um, people's egos on the line. Uh, everybody, you know, <laughs> you're working like 12 hour days, six days a week, you know, tensions can be high. And actually, one of the things I'm most proud of about Coinbase is that Fred and I, despite him leaving the company, are best friends. You know, he's still on the board, like we still hang out all the time. And actually, I've come to understand that's actually pretty unique in the startup world. It's oftentimes, when founders split, it's, you know, on bad terms. And so I attribute that to how we went through that process. We did have an executive coach, kind of marriage counselor, if you will. Um, <laughs> it was a great set of discussions we had over a period of a year, or a year and a half of just, you know, Fred is a great leader. He's a natural leader. I think he could have been the CEO of Coinbase. In a sense, we were lucky to have two of us. But, uh, you know, as someone who started the company and like I, I wanted to be CEO and he respected that fully and he respected me. And so I think for that year or so, we tried at various formations of it. We, you know, I said, all right, Fred, why don't you go externally represent the company and everything? I'll try to work on product and engineering. Or, you know, sometimes people would actually mistake. They'd come into a meeting and like Fred was just a little more confident and outgoing. And they'd be like, so Fred, you're the CEO, right? <laughs> it was, so it was funny. People would mistake it one way or the other for a while, which was fine. We'd sort of divide and conquer. But, um, you know, ultimately he decided, you know, I, I, he really wanted to run his own thing. And so he made sure the company... Coinbase was in a good place. And then he eventually did exit. And now he runs Paradigm along with uh, Matt Huang, who this was probably the top crypto investment fund out there. So he's done incredibly well. I remember when I had to go up in front of the company and announce that the co-founder, Fred, was leaving. You know, normally I didn't get nervous getting up in front of the company. I was slowly building that muscle of giving, you know, talks and I was fine. But I remember that particular moment, I went up there in front of the company I don't know if you've ever experienced this where you get like a shot of adrenaline. Mm -hmm. My legs started shaking like in front of the audience, uncontrollably shaking. I was so nervous. I tried to speak and sort of get through the words of like, Fred's going to be leaving. And my voice like cracked. I sounded yeah. like a prepubescent, you know, a teenager or whatever. And in my head, I'm like, oh my God, I'm messing this up. Like, I don't sound confident. I'm supposed to be up here like, you know, encouraging the company to, like, to make, let them know it's going to be okay. And I sound so like weak and... Anyway, people later told me like, well, you know, you were super vulnerable about it. We could tell how much you cared. And so it like, you know, it taught me a little bit that like being vulnerable is actually good leadership in some ways, but it was a, certainly a scary moment to go up there and everyone kind of, you know, was worried for 48 hours and then it was like, all right, let's get back to work. And so it built my confidence. I think in the film and throughout the film, we do get a sense of vulnerability from the Brian character, as it were. I was also struck by the sort of calmness and resoluteness of your demeanor in certain scenes. My favorite part, and I don't know if you'll be surprised by this or not, my favorite part of the film was around the IPO, because mm -hmm. I've interviewed market participants and you know folks from the exchange world about that book building process ahead of a direct listing. 
at the time of Spotify, I wrote a story about the mechanics of how it works. And it's so boring on paper. It's like we get an addictive order. It comes in and we try to find a price instead of price. And it takes a few hours. You never know exactly when it's going to happen. It's typically quite volatile. But if you read that on paper, it's kind of it's almost like this boring esoteric market structure process. But in the film, I mean, it's juxtaposed with your calmness and like, yep, <laughs> it's going to happen. You're talking to Fred on FaceTime and He's like, are you nervous? And you're like, nope, it's just going to happen. We'll see, you know, and this is like a life changing, I mean, generational life changing event for you. And you were pretty calm. That was juxtaposed with the gentleman from Goldman Sachs, who's just screaming <laughs> about this happening. And that was just incredibly cool because I think it pulled back the curtain on, you know, how a market event like that happens. And as a market structure wonk, I was just surprised because I've seen it as well from the floor of NASDAQ and you could tell this was an IPO that was unlike anything anyone has ever seen before. I think it was the largest market debut. I don't know if it was in terms of shares traded or some other metric, but you could feel the energy of this moment. And we can get a sense of that excitement in this clip, which is just fantastic. The stock will open within the next two minutes. I got the two minute warning, two minute warning. How can we really leverage this opportunity to create more jobs, more economic growth for people in every country in the world that embraces this. This is like the moment at the wedding. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Right, there's nothing cryptic about this. The first public block of stock in the blockchain. The Coinbase Genesis trade is 8.8 .8 million shares at $381. That's an ocean of nearly $3.5 billion. The largest opening trade in NASDAQ history. I think the second largest trade in exchange history. Let's go, Coinbase! It almost kind of timed with the peak of the market. Did you feel that calm and did you feel differently in the wake of the IPO? Yeah. Okay. So I, I was weirdly calm during it. You're right. And I don't think the weight and the significance of it hit me until the weeks after where I was like, you know, it's basically like, a, I think a thousand employees became millionaires or something like that. And I was just so many people reached out and I thought this was just going to be one more fundraising event. We'd done a bunch of fund, you know, a direct listing is a little different we got sort of a chance to explore this whole concept of like in a traditional IPO, you know, often like you go to the investment banks and they kind of pick a price out of thin air. At least it seems like from my point of view, I'm sure they have more sophisticated answers. And then they kind of, in my view, kind of try to underprice it and give access to their clients. And then there's a pop on day one, there's a pop, like the news will go celebrate the pop. But then in my view, that means you just left money on the table. <laughs> and we decided to do the opposite of that. We did a direct listing where, you know, we're not trying to raise a bunch of money. Let's just let the market set the price. And they open the books in kind of post only mode. People are putting in bids and asks. And um, we, the you know, insiders had set some of the initial supply, which is you have to create the supply in the, initial, in the direct listing. And so the book is sort of, they're giving you these play-by-play -play updates of like, okay, this is how many people have bid, how many people have, have asked. And like the price is moving around. And when the book is sufficiently crossed, like maybe, I don't know, 10 or 20% of the book is crossed. Someone makes the call to flip it on. Trading goes live. And the first trade happens at a true market price. It's not some made up price that, you know, some investment bankers speculated on. So that was cool to show on film, like what a direct listing process actually looks like, at least a little bit, we showed it. And then the other thing was just funny. I think, you know, you mentioned with, um, like the characters over on Wall Street that we were kind of filming, it was kind of highlighting the, the traditional financial world and the crypto financial world coming together in this really funny way. And just like the different cultures and, and people involved. Because of course, you know, Benny Adler, the guy over there at Goldman, who is kind of a true character who gets featured in the film, his job in the world of Uniswap or something like that is like, it doesn't exist. You know, somebody just opens the book on Uniswap by publishing a smart contract. And so it's like the, the contrast between the crypto world and this traditional financial world is just pretty uh, stunning as well in the film, I think. I'm a bit disappointed that you still haven't been able to fully uh, red pill your mother on exactly how this whole pedantic wonky world works. <laughs> Yeah, I assume you're referring to the, there's some scenes in there where she was like, well, we didn't quite understand it, but we trusted him. And yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people have had that experience where their kids are the ones who come and tell them about it. And I, mm -hmm. I hear that from people in Congress. I think even the director, Greg Coase, that's how he first heard about Bitcoin back in 2013. But yeah, you're right. I'll get on top of that. Red -pilling <laughs> my parents. Get ready for season three of the Tron Grand Hackathon 2022. 
There are a total of $1.2 million in prizes up for grabs in Web3, DeFi, GameFi, NFTs, and the newly added Academy and Ecosystem tracks. So what are you waiting for? Join Tron for an opportunity to showcase your work, win funding for your project, and network with other builders in the community. Tron Grand Hackathon, presented by TronDAO. To learn more, visit trondow.org. What's really striking about the film, and I've been having a few conversations recently with people across the industry. It's obviously a bear market. We've gotten out of this insane credit crisis, the meltdown of various firms and Terra Luna as sort of the poster child of this crisis or the crisis that we're sort of getting out of, so to speak. And, you know, a lot of people from the outside, they still have these narratives that hang over them about crypto. It's not regulated. It's only used for illicit purposes. These narratives are still so powerful, and especially in the media. And I think this shows there are various characters in the film that are just normal people. There are scenes in the film where you're at like, you know, corporate sort of donut happy hour type thing. And it illustrates, you know, these aren't shadowy super coders. So if someone from the outside world, not in crypto, is watching this, they get the sense that there are normal people who operate in this industry from which a livelihood is derived. Was that part of the point, you think? Yeah. To what degree was part of the mission of the film to demystify or rather humanize the actors in crypto? Because I think a lot of folks think about, you know, the shadowy super coders, the mercenaries just trying to make a quick buck, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, by the way, I love that phrase, shadowy super coder. And I think it was hilarious that <laughs> Hayden from Uniswap had that on his uh, Twitter bio as sort of a badge of honor after mm -hmm. Elizabeth Warren, I think, <laughs> made that comment. But yes, I think you're right. In the absence of, you know, clarity or a true narrative being out there, people fill the void with their own worst fears, you know? And so there is this fear that, oh, these people in crypto must be up to no good or they're bad people. Or, I, don't, I don't even know what these folks think. But that was definitely part of the goal here was, again, pull back the curtain and just show the actual people, myself being one of many, um, that are working in this industry. And why do we care about it? And, and I think... This has been my experience with Coinbase too, is oftentimes, you know, we'd call people on the phone in the early days, we were trying to get bank partners or whoever, and we'd say, hey, we're running this thing. And they're like, crypto, we don't work with crypto companies, you know, and they, and they would like literally hang up on us in some cases. But once we mm -hmm. would show up and meet these people in person, you know, they'd be like, all right, these are just like regular people. These are a bunch of nerds trying to do something good in the world. I think their intentions are good, you know they may get some details right or wrong, but like we should be rooting for them. Right. And so that was definitely one of the purposes of this documentary was like, just literally show the behind the scenes, you know, it's like the chef's table or whatever, <laughs> one of those kind of things, like show behind the scenes of like, it's not some big nefarious, scary thing. I don't know what they think it is. It's a bunch of people trying to improve the world, create more economic freedom in the world, create a better financial system. And they're doing it with technology and they're not geniuses. They're not villains. They're just like regular people trying to do their best. I'm curious how watching the doc or at least portions of it, cuts of it made you feel about some of Coinbase's tougher challenges. I think specifically maybe in hindsight, the sort of mission statement that you came out with saying Coinbase is apolitical. Do you think that was timed right? Because it kind of got tied in the media specifically to BLM, but it was a much broader mission, so to speak, of we're here to do one thing and everything else is kind of on the peripheral, so to speak. Do you think maybe the timing was wrong? The messaging there was wrong? And in future, how do you avoid a similar mistake like that? I mean, all that stuff kind of came to a crescendo. In some ways, the timing was not fully in my control because part of what sparked that whole mission first blog post was that we had a walkout at the company. You know, that was the yeah. first time that we'd had employees kind of in protest, put down their laptops and sort of refused to work. And it was in response to, you know, basically somebody asked at an employee all hands, like, are we gonna publicly support BLM as a company? And I deferred to answer the question. I was like, I don't know, we need to look into that. I haven't decided yet, basically. And there was a walkout as a result of that. So that was what kind of forced the issue and it had been bubbling for a long time and you're right society it's a much bigger issue than just the blm thing it's basically this question of like should companies be engaging in broader social activism outside of their core mission or should they just stay focused on the mission and 
anyway, I reached a place where I was like, this is actually causing distraction and division inside the company. It's going to make us less effective at achieving the core mission if we're expected to kind of jump in and try to solve all these other issues in, in society that are really challenging. So yeah, that was a tough leadership moment for me. And I think there's a lot of stuff I could have done better. I mean, ideally, I would probably would have just addressed it sooner in the company's history. I was kind of sweeping it under the rug and walking on eggshells and just not addressing it for a while. And so it eventually came to a head. And when I eventually made the exit package available to people who didn't want to go in that kind of more apolitical direction, about 5% of employees left. But um, yeah, it's been almost two years now. And I think we've kind of turned the page on it. But a lot of people still come and ask me about it because they want to think about how to run their own company, their tech company, or any company really in, in more of that fashion. Do you think there's maybe a ESG element that might hurt Coinbase from an investor perspective? If you think about maybe the lack of that, the S portion, was, was that a consideration? I don't think so. You know, ESG is its own big topic. So, you know, just like one data point is, you know, we looked at our numbers around like diversity prior to that event happening and then subsequently a year later. And basically, as I recall, the numbers had either stayed the same or gotten better across almost every metric. So I don't think it changed like the diversity makeup of the company purely from a social aspect, though. Obviously, that's much bigger than just diversity and inclusion. You know, for instance, Coinbase has a pledge 1% program. We put like 1% of company equity and profit towards charitable stuff and charitable giving that's aligned with our mission. And there's a variety of other things that we've done in that dimension. So yeah, ESG is something all public companies need to look at for better or worse. I think it's kind of unfortunate because it's actually gotten politicized in a way that's not really very helpful. Mm. But you know, it's something all public market investors, not all of them, some of them will look at closely. In the doc, you talk about the positive downstream effects that crypto can add that positively correlate with happiness, society, less war. Can you expand on that? Yeah, sure. It ties really nicely to your prior question, too. I, I, I kind of feel like our mission is inherently positive socially. Like the mission of Coinbase is to increase economic freedom in the world. And, you know, you can go look up economic freedom. It's a it's really a metric that economists look at kind of like GDP or something like that. And you can look at the different countries of the world and take a, this composite metric of economic freedom. And it looks at things like are property rights enforced and is there stable currency and is there free trade and can people start the businesses they want to start or is there a lot of bureaucracy and corruption and stuff like that and what's really cool about economic freedom is that it's uh it actually positively correlates with things that we want in society like you were just mentioning like better treatment of the environment better self-reported happiness of citizens less corruption less war lower mortality you know it's kind of this incredible idea which is that if you inject good financial infrastructure like just even sound property rights and like stable currency and things like, you know, that we sort of take it for granted sometimes in the developed world. But many people in the world don't have that. They, they don't have the ability to know that if they do something good and they get some reward for it, can they actually keep it or will it be taken away from them? And it's kind of this amazing idea, which is that if you make it possible for people to have strong property rights and keep the upside of their labor, they'll actually try to do more good stuff. And all of society functions a lot better. It's, it's more healthy. And so that's such a powerful idea that I think cryptocurrency is a unique kind of invention in the world that helps unlock that because crypto is sort of inherently linked to so many of the things in that are measured in economic freedom. Like if you want a stable currency, well, you know, Bitcoin is kind of decentralized. There's never going to be more of it. And crypto is inherently global. So it helps with free trade and it even helps with property rights, right? Like people in any country now with just remembering a 12 word phrase in a self custodial wallet, they can take their wealth with them if they need to, they're a refugee they need to flee there's not their wealth is not going to be confiscated as has happened in various countries around the world so yeah economic freedom is something i'm really passionate about and i think it's inherently uh, linked to esg in a very positive way our the mission of coinbase what do you think is the most concrete example of how coinbase has facilitated or yielded economic freedom for people today yeah, well, a lot of what we try to do with our products, you know, it sounds simple, but it's really hard to do is we just try to make crypto trusted and then easier to use. So, for instance, if, you know, there's people who want to use um, our self-custodial wallet, Coinbase wallet, we try to make that super easy to use in a way that they're not going to accidentally lose their funds. You know, non-technical people can sign up and do it. People in emerging markets like Venezuela or wherever that are going through hyperinflation or 
don't have access to stable currency, you know, they can get access to that. I think even, you know, our core products are um, really helping people just get a lot of the fiat money in the world into crypto and then start to be able to use all these new things that are coming up in Web3, right? Which could be our DeFi or Web3, like simpler bait to borrow and lend is something, again, we kind of take that for granted in the developed world. But like I spent a year living in Argentina and you can't get credit there. The average person cannot get a mortgage to buy a home in Argentina. Like only wealthy people really who have could buy these assets in cash or they can get loans from like foreign banks and things like that. They're the people who can buy real estate. So everybody else who can't, afford to buy a whole house with cash and can't get a mortgage, they basically have to rent. There's little things like that, that we just, the financial system is not well-developed. It's not universally uh, accessible around the world. And I think to be fair, like we're just starting to scratch the surface of our mission. I wouldn't say we've like even made a huge dent in it today, but all these little pieces coming together with the blockchains being more scalable and remittance and better, um, you know, liquidity in various markets around the world and, DeFi as it becomes more accessible with better lending products in different markets. Like, I think this is a pretty timeless mission in the sense it'll take 10, 20, 30 years to start to really make a dent in global economic freedom. So I don't want to claim that we've made huge progress yet. We're still in the early days. In 20 years, though, Coinbase, or if we think about what Coinbase is doing or facilitating, maybe it is someone in Argentina is able to go through the pipes and plumbing of Coinbase to secure a form of a mortgage through a DeFi application or something of that nature. It's almost like the conduit to that world. Exactly. Yeah. And it may not even be a service provided directly by Coinbase, but we're sort of people's primary financial account, the app that they use to access the whole crypto economy. And, you know, there's going to be thousands of companies and people, DAOs and everything that are creating this stuff. It's obviously not something we can just do, but it's pretty exciting. It does feel like we're at the birth of creating a new economy for the world that's more global and decentralized and fair and free. So that's pretty cool. If a founder is listening to this show, and this is really a founder film, in my opinion, it is less of a crypto film. It's more of a founder film than it is a crypto film to an extent. What advice yeah. would you give them if they're starting out a company? And maybe, you know, when you were discussing the sort of first office that you had with Fred, I was hearkening back to my old WeWork days where there were just three of us, you know, sweaty guys in a room. What do you tell that person that's at that stage? Yeah, well, you're totally right. I think it is, in fact, the tagline, I think, at least in some of the material I saw was a founder's story. It, it actually is that it's, and it's, my goal is that it hopefully inspires people who are either in the trenches doing a startup or think, have thought about it to sort of, that it demystifies it for them and they, and they actually can go and get started. And I guess the thing I want them to take away is, um, I don't know. I mean, the most important thing from founders, the, the skill set of a founder, I think, is determination. It is the ability to move from setback to setback with no loss of enthusiasm, as Winston Churchill said in a famous mm. quote. And oftentimes when you see startups from the outside, you know, it's a company that's already become successful. And so you think, oh, like it was just they caught lightning in a bottle and they were lucky or brilliant or whatever, but it's not true. Most of the startups that I've encountered, um, you know, I was an early employee at Airbnb. I went through Y Combinator. There was, you know, Instacart was in our class of Y Combinator. There was a hundred other companies. And, you know, sometimes you have to find the right idea. Sometimes you don't have the right idea. You just keep trying things. You keep trying things. And the ones that were relentlessly determined, I think, improve their chances of success, getting lucky. And um, that's what I would say to founders. Just, by the way, Coinbase is probably the 10th business idea that I've tried in my life, you know, some of them lasted three weeks and I, and it didn't work. Others lasted many, many years and didn't really work or had a tiny, tiny base hit. Coinbase is probably like the 10th idea I tried and it just happened to work. And most people would not have tried 10 times. You know, they would have stopped after a few and said, okay, this whole entrepreneurship thing is not for me. So I probably would have stopped after the fifth time. That would have been <laughs> my limit. I think you draw upon many different folks across finance, tech, venture capital as inspirations. Ray Dalio, I think, is one. Mark Andreessen, uh, unsurprisingly. Um, are there any others? And maybe what sort of, what about their essence as a founder um, has inspired you? Well, yeah, I mean, so I think you can draw inspiration from a lot of different places, but it doesn't mean you want to, I'm always hesitant to say it because people think, oh, the, 
you know, you want to be just like that person. I, I don't think that's right. You want to draw the Fair best. Enough. Yeah, the best from lots of different places. But yeah, I mean, Mark Andreessen, someone who I grew up as a kid, almost seeing like what he was doing with Netscape. I thought that was really inspiring. You know, I think a lot of the early, you know, Larry Page and um, now it's probably like Elon is probably inspiring a whole generation of entrepreneurs. And just in terms of thinking bigger, more ambitious stuff, like hard tech problems, um, tackling the sorts of things that only people thought governments could tackle previously, like climate change or space programs. And so, you know, I think that's something that's certainly inspiring to me too. I think, you know, Coinbase is trying to help create a new financial system for the whole world. That's kind of crazy. And that's arguably in the realm of governments or whatever. And so I think what we're seeing is that if you're an aspiring young person who wants to have an impact on the world, I mean, technology is probably the most powerful lever that's out there to improve the world right now. And, you know, you want to fix education. Okay. Go make Khan Academy or whatever you want to fix climate change, like go do fusion energy or carbon sequestration or make Tesla or whatever, you know? So I think if you want to make a more fair and free financial system, you know, go into crypto. So technology and innovation is kind of science is the root of all the innovation that can lead to people founding companies that commercialize that technology. And then that's how you change the world. In my view, that's the best way to change the world with affecting millions of people around the world, or maybe even billions. Well said, sir. Well, Brian, Thanks so much for joining the show. I hope all of our listeners check out Coin. Once again, we've been joined today by Brian Armstrong, co-founder and CEO of Coinbase. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, one other question. Yeah. Do you still have those pajamas? Oh, man, I don't think so. Maybe at my parents' oh, house. I'm not sure. Brutal. But I, we should actually do like a little swag and like sell some of those. That would be hilarious. But... You really should. I'd be the first <laughs> one to buy it. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, Frank. That was an awesome set of interview questions. So thank you so much. The Scoop will be back for you again with another great guest. Have an awesome day. Looking for more great insights from The Block? Check out The Block Research, the premier platform for research content on crypto markets and the digital asset industry. The Block Research membership includes cutting-edge reports, webinars, company maps, and more, available via our dedicated research portal. Visit theblockresearch.com to find out how to join today or contact a member of our sales team at sales at theblockcrypto.com and let them know that Frank sent you.